Gracefully and Frankly is brought to you by Sierra Sill. Two words that are hard to say if you're missing a front tooth. Sierra Sill. But it's the name of an all-natural joint pain relief formulated in Canada that promises you will feel a difference in your knees. They got a rare patent for knee pain relief. And it's taken by athletes, active folks, and people like you and me, Lisa's husband and mine. Sierra Sill capsules spray even dog chews. Natural, effective, and with that money-back guarantee, you have nothing to lose but the pain. Get to the website and find out more and place your order sierrasill.com Sierra like the mountains, S-I-L dot com and you'll get 10% off by using the code GF Episode 91 Is it wrong that we're treating our pets as our children? Mm, Some say it is Especially if they're Scandinavian and we'll explain that to you as well The dangers of perfectionism. Uh, How does it affect you uh, or me uh, or you uh, and why? Okay, (laughs) we'll break it down. Why are you talking about this, Lisa? Why Did I do something wrong? No, it's not about you. Never. It's no, sometimes, but not this time. Not about, (laughs) well, it's not. Okay, and a whole bunch more. We don't know where it's going to go, but we're glad you're along for the ride. And speaking of traveling with your friends, I'm going to be doing it. I'm taking my Envy Pillow tomorrow, Lisa. Good stuff. Envy Pillow may be the only pillow that comes with a how-to guide. <laughs> After you buy your Envy Pillow, you get a link to a video on how to use your pillow. And it's not because it's complicated, but the gals at Envy Pillow just want you to get the most out of it. For example, did you know mm-hmm that there is a dual neck support system. Each support on either side has a slightly different density, so you can figure out which one works for you. Also, there is a support in case you want your pillow to be a little bit higher. That's optional. You can Yes, comes with. It's not just about how to use the pillow, what's in the pillow, and it's only like, what, a minute and 10 seconds. But it's well worth it, and it's because it's this special pillow. Find out why we sleep with them and why you might want to as well. Go to NV, E-N-V-Y, pillow.com, find out more, and get 10% off anything they sell there using the code GF. Well, guess what? Our bags are packed. The dogs are traumatized. (laughs) And we're ready to fly to Toronto tomorrow. So send thoughts and prayers. Oh, I'm so glad we didn't book with Air Canada and sitting on pins and needles. And uh, looking forward to getting to Toronto, seeing some folks, and then moving on to Ottawa. Won't see you this time, though, Lisa. No, we have this planned. You're going to be back in October, and it's all good. Hope you have a wonderful trip. I'll be in touch with you throughout. But what's going on with Dot and Livy? Well, here's the thing. When we board dogs around here, there's a boarder. She is kind of in cahoots with the breeder for these two dogs. So she has like eight or 10 Havanese, including Dottie's baby daddy. Hmm. So we were thinking, okay, we'll leave them with Trudy. But it ends up costing, I think, like between them $300 a day or something. What? I know. I know. It's so much. Or it might be 150 a day, but I think it's closer to 300 Regardless, that's a lot. It is. So then we got thinking, and I asked a friend, I asked a few friends, do you have somebody who wants to come to Sydney and and stay for a little bit? And long story short, we got connected with a woman who lives in Saskatchewan, and she used to live in our building. She's got loads of friends here, loves Sydney, and so we paid for her airline ticket to fly to our place and fly home, which ends up being a lot cheaper than that boarding, and she's going to stay in our place with Dottie and Livy. Now, wow. Yeah, you've got to okay, what would you do as the uh, as the thing online goes, am I the a-hole? I said right out, I said they're going to want to sleep with you. I hope that's okay. Oh. Would you would that be a deal breaker for you or you know, I love I love the you know, animals in the bed and cuddling around and everything. So, why how did she react? Well, um I didn't give her a chance to react. I thought, oh, that's that's a little forward. I better soften that a bit. And I said, look, Celia, 
They have crates. They can sleep in their crates. You know, they're great about that, but they will want to sleep with you. So then the question is, okay, do we put Celia in our bed, which isn't something we would normally do, or put her in the guest bedroom, which is away from Dottie's usual paper? We can move their food and water into their bedroom instead of ours. Anyway, it's just little problems and things to figure out, and I think it'll work itself out. I think so, too. And I think the overriding umbrella in all of this is that they're going to be at home in their familiar place, yep. being looked after with their own food and their own, you know what yep. I mean? They'll be in their own environment. So I think they'll be more comfortable regardless of whether some of these little things change yeah. here and there, like just, just temporarily. That's how we look at it with cuddles, too, because we couldn't find someone to stay in the house while we were away, which is what we prefer. I know he's a cat. I know everything else, but it's what we prefer. And people love to stay here when it's beach time, but it's not beach time, and we're going uh, on a little trip. So we actually got friends of ours who do go to other people's places and stay and look after their pets for a free stay. Oh, okay. Okay. And they're just going to come over uh, once or twice a day and look after him. Now, he's going to be lonely. I'm already feeling bad. Mm. But he's going to be lonely without people around. He really loves his people, and he's very vocal and all that. But it's four days. I think he'll be okay. <laughs> but it's hard. It is hard because we become so attached to our pets. And we remember a time when they were chained up in the backyard or they had dog houses in the yard and the idea of the family dog on the bed. You might as well have been asking if you could bring in the cow, for example. It just <laughs> wasn't going to happen. But we've changed. I think that we've yeah. changed our relationships with our animals. And some people are saying that it's to their detriment and to ours. In fact, of course, the New York Times did a story on it. Are we loving our pets to death? Well, it used to be a joke, Erin, as I'm sure you saw all over the place about calling your cat or dog your kid. Or your fur baby. Yeah, but now people will actually equate them with children. And listen, I know that's not right. <laughs> You know, I never had a child, but I know better than to say an animal is equal, the same as a child. It may be filling the child role in your yeah. life, but that doesn't make it a child. It's still an, a different species. All those things. Yeah, it fills the child-sized hole in your heart if you have one. Mm. And it took two of these little fur balls to do that for us. But I totally hear you. And it's gone to the point where two-thirds of North American homes have at least one pet, and that's up 56% from a generation ago wow. in 1988. And listen to this. At least Americans spent $137 billion on their pets last time they checked, and that's wow. up about $14 billion from the previous year. So, oh my God. I know, it's insane. Our pets are becoming more like us. We see knapsack carriers, which I think are adorable, dog hydrotherapy, and stays in boutique cat hotels. And let me be clear on where Dottie and Livy were staying. It was a rural property with a bunch of crates and a bunch of Havanese just running around in the dirt and muck and living their best lives. It's not a spa. That's not mm. what we were going for there. But right. there are also all these enrichment toys. Right. It's not enough to throw a ball. Right. It's got to be something that stimulates their math skills and yes. all these other things. Exactly. And some dogs need that. Like Leroy, my border yes. collie, almost needed a job just to keep him busy. Right. So I get it. But some of these toys, a cat does not need to learn how to ignore you in more than one language. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, the thing is, I think partly because we're not as engaged with our pets as perhaps we should be. Or or is that just a modern guilt trip? It used to be you had a dog and it didn't have to go everywhere with you and it didn't have to be taken to a restaurant. And I'm not complaining or disparaging anybody who does. If I had my way, we take ours absolutely everywhere. But I think right. that the limits have kind of gotten blurred. Yeah, and we, and when I say we, I don't mean just you and me. I mean the collective mm -hmm. we 
treat our animals like they're little people. Like I've seen things on TikTok and elsewhere, and I know they're just done for clicks and views, where an animal has a seat at the table, like the cat or whatever can sit and eat with you at the table. Well, that's, that's, I mean, dogs, let's remember how dogs became our best friends. They realized that we did all this hunting Mm -hmm. and they wouldn't have to. So they snuggled up to us and went, hey, buddy, Mm -hmm. I'll be your most loyal friend if you feed me. And they're smart. But I think that they're also status symbols sometimes. Oh, God, yes. And remember after the pandemic, how many people were dropping them off at shelters? Yeah. Because they got them during the pandemic for company. And I was like, wait a minute, this is a lifetime commitment. And we got to treat a dog like a dog and a cat like a cat and a ferret like, I don't know how you treat a ferret. But. I don't know how you treat a ferret either. But this surprised me that there are countries where it's illegal, Sweden in particular, and Finland, creating animals in the home is illegal. I don't get free-ranging the dogs in the house when we're not home. What? I mean, they're trained, but to what extent? Yeah, I think that should be a, an owner's decision, you know yeah. what your dog can or cannot be trusted with or whatever. And some love their, I mean, if you do it right, they love their crate. It's their little fort. It's like they built a blanket fort. Exactly. And you've seen it. We put Livy and Dottie in the same crate because they want to be together. Yeah. Dottie doesn't like when we go out. So Livy will go in her crate and Dottie goes with her. And we wouldn't leave them together like that for a long time. But they're happy together. Yeah, I couldn't believe that when I saw that. We know now we don't leave dogs in the car. And I think that it doesn't matter what the temperature is now. I still won't do it in case somebody decides that the dogs are stressed being alone in the car. And they break your window and right. trying to be a good person. And Right. Yeah. Okay, can I express an unpopular opinion? Oh, please. And I'm really worried to do this, but I'm sorry. I don't like that cats are no longer allowed to be declawed there i said it i understand why yeah but shoot well here's the thing aaron i think you'll get some support here because we have only rescued i'm using air quotes Mm. declawed cats that is a requirement we're not doing the declawing somebody else did it and it can't be done now but right i And I've said this to Derek, and I don't want my stuff shredded. And it's another reason we didn't get kittens. So I I get it. I mean, I'm not going to get them declawed, but I prefer one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I can hear all the emails. I can hear what people are thinking or saying. How would you like your toenails or your fingernails pulled off? And I would like to think that there is a humane way that it is being dealt with by veterinarians who've done it forever. But... It is an amputation, right? Like they actually cut the bone. Oh. It's not just the nails coming out. It was explained to me that it is actually an amputation and that whole mechanism that pushes the claw out has to go. Oh, okay. But at the same time, there are all sorts of little things people have tried. There are these little caps you can put on the end. Hmm. Keeping them trimmed is number one. Oh my God, have you tried cutting a cat's toenails? Well, it depends on what cat because when we had Miss Sugar... She would have let him do just about anything. And so she was really cool as long as she could look up into his eyes. But Cuddles, forget about it. I mean, he acts like he's being murdered. So Yeah, I get that. Yeah, it is difficult. No, I I know exactly where you're coming from. You don't want to do it, but you prefer it was done. Right. Like a circumcision. No, I'm kidding. Um, (laughs) Yeah, we went there. I'm trying to divert attention. So please spare me the emails that say I am disappointed in you because it's an opinion that I have and I will not go out and buy a cat and have it declawed in some back alley cat declawing. Aaron, you're responding to criticism that hasn't arrived. I know. Okay. There's the ledge. You've talked me (laughs) off it. It was just an opinion and I'm not going to do it. And just keep your damn cats inside. That's all. Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. Another one, one in the in the little village I live in just got hit. And No. Why, why, why? No, they don't have to hunt. No, they don't have to do any of that stuff. Uh, but anyway, again, that's a tough one to talk people out of. Do you suppose? 
knows that my expecting criticism over having an opinion, which is kind of what a podcast is all about, is an example of perfectionism. Mm. Well, maybe. I think expecting criticism is a sensitivity to being criticized. So maybe it's part and parcel of wanting to be perfect so nobody can criticize you. Yeah, okay, I had to work that out verbally. Well, you did a good job a few weeks ago when we were going through the list of triggers and what they may mean, and that hearing everything as criticism is you weren't given enough positive feedback when you were a kid. Yeah. So I came across a chart of the vicious cycle of perfectionism, and if it resonates nearly as loudly as those triggers that we talked about a few episodes ago, this might be really enlightening for people. The vicious cycle starts with setting unrealistic goals. So let's use our conversation today as an unrealistic goal that everybody is going to agree with everything I say. Okay? (laughs) Can that be it? Okay. And then number two, I failed to achieve that goal. Uh Uh-oh. Somebody's mad. Okay. Now what will happen next? Decreased productivity And effectiveness. Mm. So this is where we move it to the general you. Take the example off of me here. First, you set an unrealistic goal. Two, you fail to achieve the goal. Then decreased productivity and effectiveness because you think, oh, why bother, right? Yeah. And if somebody has constructive criticism for you, they're afraid to tell you. I found that out about myself Mm -hmm. a long time ago. Okay. The next step is self-criticism. Oh, you suck. Why would you even bother? You Mm. shouldn't even... Why bother writing that piece if it's not going to immediately, you know, become a bestseller or... Right. This is something familiar to both of us, this voice that says, no, don't bother. There are a million books out there like that. And what voice do I have to add to it? The next one is that you have to try harder next time. And then... That's back to one, setting unrealistic goals. Hmm. So that's the cycle of perfectionism. How many of us, Lisa, are in that? Yeah, if you don't allow yourself to make a mistake, you know, we can talk about Einstein's 198 failed light bulbs or whatever before he got one. (laughs) He didn't invent the light bulb. I know. But um, oh, oh, you were making a joke. I'm yeah, sorry. It's okay. That's all right. It was perfect. <laughs> that time Einstein couldn't get that car to run. <laughs> but we have much more scrutiny on us these days as well. Even the biggest stars, the most famous celebrities who have millions of social media followers, get so much crap. And some of them have to go, you know what? I'm out for a while. I can't take it. Yeah. And others just say they won't look at it. My concern by of not looking at it, and maybe you share this, is that maybe there's something I can learn from it. Maybe there's a grain of truth in there. Yes. Yes. You know? Yep. It's a perspective you hadn't considered. Yeah. And you brought me the perspective on the decline that I hadn't considered, the amputation part. And when you yeah. put it in stark terms like that, okay, I get it, you know? And I'm not going to judge either way. I don't have a horse in this race or a cat for that matter. (laughs) I'm not getting my dog's tails cropped or their ears cropped or any of the things now that are judged to be some form of cruelty. Not by me. I mean, I don't have an opinion on that. (laughs) Ah, geez. I'm such a chicken, Lisa. I really am. You know what, though? People who have never been in radio, Mm. for example, don't know how much shit we have eaten yeah in morning radio so many times i've heard from people oh you must hear this all the time i just love listening to your whatever it's like no i never hear it ever ever please tell me right we get ratings we get whatever else but the compliments are few and far between yeah yeah it's true and i can remember clear as day when things didn't come out the right way or were misconstrued there was a young woman who died when her taxi was in a crash in Toronto and she was killed because she didn't have her seatbelt on. And at some point we were talking, I can't remember which co-host it was. And I said, oh, it's so sad. If only she had had her seatbelt on. And we were all still kind of reeling from the Diana Princess of Wales death in Paris for somewhat similar reasons that a seatbelt might have saved her. But then I heard from this girl's aunt who said, how dare you say it was her fault? Uh, No, 
No, it wasn't her fault. I was lamenting that one thing might have changed everything. And it was mm -hmm. thinking aloud, which you're not allowed to do unless it's right. a fully formed thought that everyone agrees with. Right. So you don't get the grace right. that you might get in a conversation right. or in a regular conversation. You might get a chance to say, but what I mean is, or there are so many things. I, one time I said something on when I was doing a talk show in Hamilton and I misidentified somebody as I called him an MPP instead of an MP immediately corrected it went oh made a mistake there I got a death threat <laughs> like you just you just never know what kind of person is just taking offense and really Taking offense is a choice. You can decide to not be offended, right. you know. But um, can we backtrack to the death threat thing? Up until now, and mentioning cat declawing, I haven't. <laughs> I have never had one, and it just seems you hear about them all the time. I oh, mean, geez, I probably had three. I think I had three in my career. Yeah, but that's from news and talk and stuff. Wow, really? And how seriously did anyone around you take them? The last one. They didn't take it very seriously at all. And the guy not only threatened my life, but told me he knew that I was the first one in the radio station. Oh. All of these things that he knew about my behavior and movements. Oh, geez. So I was standing at the back door uh, with one of our engineers. And I said, well, at least that camera's there. So if I get bludgeoned, you know me and my dark humor. Mm -hmm. So if I get bludgeoned, they'll have the guy on camera. And he goes, oh, that's not hooked up to anything. That's just for show. Whoa. So there was no camera. Nobody cared, Aaron. Nobody cared. So I, and this is recent. We're talking within the last 10 years. So I um, actually got a hold of the guy. I phoned him. I found his name. I looked him up and I <gasps> called him and I apologized. And I had nothing to apologize for. Right. But do you want to be alive or do you want to be right? Yeah. And he ended up apologizing to me, saying, oh, I got, you know, I got my back up and all this stuff and went over the top and everything. Holy. But, well, I mean, if they weren't going to protect me, I was going to protect me. You know, it would be a stupid reason to get whatever it was he was going to do. So, yeah, but, anyway. but no one backed you up on this? No, no. Nobody really cared. Oh, <laughs> it was kind of like, oh, well, you know, but the, in their defense... I was working at a place where everybody was so beaten up by budgetary constraints and everybody was doing three jobs. Sounds and, like you Bell. Know. Have I hit it? Is it Bell? <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So I give them some, some leeway for that too. But Jeez. anyway, I took it upon myself to fix that one. Wow. So to get back to my original point, it's no wonder you have a sensitivity about criticism. You're doing your best. You're at the top of the game. Mm. And still people criticize. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. Especially with the anonymity of the internet. It's just, whew, it's unbelievable. Yeah. Oh, want to lighten <laughs> things up a bit while we're talking about dogs and cats and stuff. You brought this to our attention. Listen to this guy from South Africa. This is hilarious. <laughs> In Springfield, they're eating the dogs. They're eating the cats. They're eating the pets of the people that live there. They're eating the dogs. They're eating the cats. They're eating the pets of the people that live there. People of Springfield, please don't eat my cats. Why would you do that? Eat something else. Okay, so who is he? What's his story? And, and there's a great cause behind this. Yeah, he's called the Kiffness, K-I-F-F-N-E-S-S, -S, and he's from South Africa, yeah. as you said, and a musician, and he's got millions of followers. He had one and a half million on Instagram when that song came out, but probably more now. Yeah. <laughs> and all of the downloads or streams of that song pay him, of course, because he's got so many followers. So all of the money he makes, he's going to donate to the Humane Society of Springfield and look after all of the homeless and adoptable animals in that city. Uh, he's on tour right now. Like, he's sold out in places around Europe and stuff. He's he's a real thing. Wow. So kind of cool that somebody from who's not even from America would just nail it <laughs> and get, get it so So good. it's just kind of him and his sin 
synthesizer and uh, and he puts on a show. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Too funny. It's just amazing that they're still doubling down on this story. And what people don't see on the front page is that the woman who made this whole story up on Facebook says, I didn't mean for this all to happen. Well, oh. best intentions, lady. It's a little late for that. Yeah. But now, you know, school closings and bomb threats. And yeah. It could result in some real harm to people. And that's so scary. Well, it is. And it's all so echoey of what was happening in Europe with them saying the most horrific anti-Semitic things about what Jewish people were doing. And it all just falls into line with this same trope of otherism. And these people who are being targeted, who happen to be from Haiti, are working legally. They're doing good jobs that so many Americans won't do to begin with. And it's just the otherism that this side feeds into, and it's despicable, and it's what we have to keep out of Canada. Did you see Nathan Clark's media conference? I don't know Nathan Clark. Who is that? Nathan Clark's son died last oh, yes. year when a minivan driven by a Haitian immigrant... Yeah, a school bus hit him and killed him. Hit a school bus, yes, and it was an yeah. accident. So he held this father who lost his 11-year-old son, held a news conference and said to the Republican candidates, stop. He said, you know, I wish my son was killed by a white man. Can you imagine having to say that? And he he said he wasn't murdered, it was an accident, and you have to stop politicizing Mm. it. We're tired of hearing our son's name in the media being misused. And it's just, you know, all this stuff is so heartbreaking. And it makes you wonder where it's going to end. It really does. It, we live in such bizarre times, Lisa. Ah, well, we got to end this week on a happy note. So make me laugh. No. <laughs> <laughs> How about the job that Eugene and Dan Levy did at the Emmys on Sunday night? Could they have been any more perfect? No, they were absolutely perfect. Not only Canadian, not only father and son, but just their jokes and, I don't know, I, I love the whole thing. They got a little edgy here and there. Yep. Even the funny moment when they, when when Eugene supposedly didn't know where stage right was. Oh, that was great. It was fantastic. He is the greatest straight man. He's so deadpan. And, of course, the in memoriam section is always going to tick somebody off. We went, wait, where's Matthew Perry? But he was in last year's, exactly, though. Exactly, right? because yeah. there was an Emmys award that had been delayed by the actor strike and the writer yeah. strike and all the strikes. And so it went in January, and Matthew was in that one. And mm. then, of course, this one was, you know, it ended on Bob Newhart, which was absolutely perfect. Yeah. Uh, the show itself was great, but there were a lot of empty seats towards the end of the show. It's like, yo, get yourself some seat fillers if all the celebrities are going to leave early to beat traffic. Yeah. What would you think of the way people were dressed? I thought that, uh, for the most part, everybody looked great. There were some very interesting tuxedo choices. I love the bling on the lapel that a lot of the men are wearing. Mm. I uh adored Christine Baranski's gold wrap dress. I thought she looked yeah. good. Candace Bergen, whose cheekbones should be in some kind of Hall of Fame, was wearing a <laughs> coppery sequin dress that reflected up on her face, which didn't do her any favors, but she was iconic and epic, as usual. Yeah. And eyeglasses. Eugene Levy, Dan Levy should be in every eyeglass commercial for the rest of our lives. <laughs> I absolutely agree, but okay. What's Maya Rudolph thinking? Why does she have to always take down someone's curtains and wrap them around herself? I don't know. Her (laughs) style sense is, to be kind, unique. Yeah. Usually among the SNL folks, Kristen Wiig is the most bizarrely turned out. But, I mean, they're comedians. But there were a lot of kilts. Yes, there were. And uh, How about Alan Cummings wearing pants with a kilt? Yeah. I mean, the, that was an unusual choice. It was unusual. The baby reindeer guy, whose name I can never remember, had a kilt on. Somebody put Reese Witherspoon on a worst dress list, and I thought she looked adorable. But huh. anyway, if, if different strokes for different folks. If you're not yeah. pulling down ruffles off the uh, the top of the <laughs> 1980s curtains, um, yes. you're, you're doing all right with me. And are we being unfair? 
with feedback? I don't think so. Because when you're in an award show, you know you're there. You've been judged. That's why you're up on the stage. Good for you. And you don't care what people like us think of what you wore, exactly. right? If you do, you've got problems. <laughs> you're not making enough money or something. Would that we should be criticized for our award show wear, Lisa. That would be a big, big day. What do you say? What did you wear to watch the Emmys? I wore, oh, let me see. A Blue Jays night shirt. It went just above the knee. Hmm. Yeah, no makeup. Nice. Um, yeah, yeah, that's what I wore. What did you wear? I had on a pair of shorts yes. that were, I'd say, khaki. And okay. a t-shirt with uh, Port Stanley emblazoned on the front. And partway through the show, I undid the back of my bra and took it out of my armhole. Well, there you go. Super cash. Does Derek get excited about that the way Rob does? He still thinks it's some magic trick from dating days when I can take a bra off from under my shirt. Derek looks at me like I'm some sort of magician. He just yeah. does She's not. a witch. Yes, exactly. <laughs> we have found the witch. May we burn her? Burn her! <laughs> All right. As a meme I read yesterday said, do something today that would have gotten you burned at the stake 500 years ago. And, All you know, right. gold. Shouldn't that be on a coffee mug? Exactly. <laughs> uh, thank you to Envy Pillow and to Sierra Sill. No pets were harmed during the making of this podcast, nor will they be, we promise. Right. Okay. Happy travels. Thank you. Thank you.